Today on the livecast, summer is coming, hope in the age of doom scrolling. Hey, welcome to the live cast. I'm Glenn Scrivener. <laughs> I'm Paul Feasy. Just love that look on your face as it starts. Am I? Is it? Are we doing? Are we doing this? We're yeah, doing no, this no, thing. we're good. We're good. We're in. We're in. We're well, in. we'll see. We'll see what the live chat says we'll find about out. how we're doing. Um, guys, do do weigh in with how the audio is going. That was our big struggle last week. Yep, we think we've sorted it. Or I should say, we the interns have sorted it. Yeah, that's right. The <laughs> Take, interns are around. That's taking the it out of our hands. So yeah, that's yeah. definitely a positive. So um, yes, yeah, summer is coming. Why why are we saying summer is coming, Paul? Uh, well, we're talking about hope. Yeah. Aren't we really? And yeah. so summer is coming is like the antithesis of the phrase many of us will have heard, winter is coming. Yes. Of course. We've all heard it, but we don't know where it's from, do we? Because none of us have watched Game of Thrones, have we? Obviously. Watch what? Being, being, yeah, exactly. We're not familiar what, with what, what is that? What is of? that thing? <laughs> so uh, I heard uh, recently on the Rest is History podcast with Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook, uh, they were talking about Game of Thrones. Um, and they mentioned the catchphrase, winter is coming, because you've got the White Walkers up north, and mm. kind of there's the threat coming from up north, which is interesting, biblically speaking, for the, the threat kind of generally does come from the north, and you're very worried about that. But the threat that George R. R. Martin said, um, winter is coming, uh, was an analogy for, was the threat of global warming. Okay. And on the rest is history, um, uh, podcast, they said, all oh, right, so it's, it's winter is coming, but really they're saying summer is coming. And then they laughed at how weird it would be to say that summer is coming as some kind of threat. Yep. And actually, um, sort of biblically speaking, summer is coming is pretty much the Bible's eschatology. It's, it's the Bible's doctrine of the last things. Yeah. Um, because the Bible, when it thinks about the future, is incredibly optimistic. Um, but I I'm not sure that people get that impression. I'm not even sure that Christians <laughs> have the impression that the future is bright. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. No. I mean, I don't know. I, I think I wonder whether people really think about it much at all. Yeah. Or when we do think, or if we think about the future, we probably think about the future much like everyone else in that yes. we're quite we're quite doom laden, aren't we? Generally, yes. like, oh, it's all things are getting worse and like it's all going downhill and right. stuff like that. We tend to. Ha have that kind of thing. There might be a couple of optimists out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Weirdos. Yeah. <laughs> and we think that that's just a temperamental thing as opposed to a quite biblical thing. You know, we, we'll, we'll get onto some scriptures in a minute that, but, that put, you know, faith, hope, and love at the heart of the Christian, Christian life. Yeah, Christian belief. Like we're meant to style. be, you know, so we're people of faith. Everyone's got, kind of got that. And we do the love thing. Sure. Okay. I guess Jesus told us to. But hope, hope. Are we? Are we really people of hope? Um, <laughs> and we've we've put um, uh, yeah hope in a t in a time of doom scrolling into the title. Mm. So Paul, tell us what what is doom scrolling? Yeah. So did you say it was the it was actually the word of the year at, for some point, or was it a, the, the Macquarie English Dictionary sort of added it added as, it as the thing. word for, uh, probably two years ago now? Okay. And there's so. been there's been a, a bit more doom since then. So yeah, yeah, we've had our fair share. So doom scrolling is the act of consuming large quantities of negative online news in kind of a single sitting, um, and then this, and it's particularly with kind of with people selectively focusing on negative stories, um, and kind of giving more weight to. Um, things that might suggest a threat to their life or yes. things like that, rather than a kind of balanced input yes. into your life. So that doom scrolling, just always find, like flicking through all the negative news yeah. and just 
consuming that, absorbing it. I, that's an interesting way of putting it because that that put that puts all the onus on like the consumer of news as though it's it's just demand driven as though like I go to my Twitter feed like trying to please give me like bad news, mm. whereas like surely some of the blame needs to go to like media companies who are just feeding the bad who news. Who want to supply uh, yeah. the bad yeah, yeah. news. Because you know, if it bleeds, it leads, and all that. Yeah, well, there was some, uh, you know, some in, in looking looking it up. Some people were saying they 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 thought there was maybe a bit of a change around the nineties when mm. more news channels and things arrived, more media outlets, and people had to therefore compete. Yes. To actually, you can't just have a headline that says what happened. You right. have to have something sensational. Yeah. You know, that's that grips people. So if you put something terrifying in your headline yeah. that's full of doom and scaremongering, yes, um, people are more likely to to click on it or you know get it open. Yes, and and therefore, you know, in this in this internet age, um, people have noticed that a higher level of online presence and online media consumption leads to higher levels of depression and yeah, mental health issues. Yeah, and mental health issues. And when people ask um, folks from around the world, do you think the world is getting better or worse? We've got, we've got a graphic, um, I think, that, that just describes how different countries feel about the future. And um, surprisingly, for those who can't um, see it, if you're just listening on the podcast, for instance, um, China, 41% uh, uh, of those in China think the world is getting better, mm. all things considered. Um, and then you have to go all the way down to the bottom of, of the, the foot of the table is being propped up by France. 3% thinks the world's getting better. But here's a shocker. Australia, 4%. Mm. Only 4% of Australians are... Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I wouldn't have... Nessa, if you'd asked, out of, even just out of that selection of countries there, I'm not sure I would have put China at the top. I mm. wouldn't have guessed that China would have just said... Yeah. overwhelmingly up and coming yeah, china well, well yeah i mean there is that but yeah you know there's, there's nothing there's no real sense i get generally that mm. they're overly optimistic you know well 21st century belongs to yeah, china yeah yeah you i mean know, I, I get like, that um yeah australia though that's quite surprising it's i really thought you know everyone in yeah. australia seems quite chipper sun's wow. shining you yeah. know yeah yeah they're down the beach having a barbie yeah but right. then but then like like Australians are probably far more, well, they're probably more environmentally aware and concerned. It's true. Than Chris, those in Europe. Christoph Keating just said about China, and actually this this might be true. He said, um, mm. "I'm not surprised. Propaganda is strong in China for the bright new world." Yeah. So actually, the question is, are they really up to? Uh, do they yes. really have a hope for the future? Yeah. yeah. Or, or you know, or are they just towing the line? Yeah. Or have they been tricked into thinking it's a bright new? Brave new world out there. And Christophe uh, follows that up with, and we French are eternal <laughs> pessimists. I like that it's an eternal pessimism. <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to lift. The future is pessimism, people. Join us. I would be disappointed by any other result. Disappointed as well. <laughs> I would hope so, uh, brilliant, Christophe. Brilliant. I, would, I would hope that you would be disappointed. But yeah. Um, and. And I guess it makes you think, like, what is it you're looking to to give you your bearings? Because if you're looking to the Chinese Communist Party and you're in China and and they control the news agencies, then then I guess your diet will be fed by good news stories about China is up and coming in the world and, and we are the future. Yeah. Whereas we um, voluntarily choose <laughs> to, to go on Twitter. <laughs> like, no one's forcing us to. Do ourselves down, and you know. Yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah, it's a British pastime, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, we're, we're incredibly unpatriotic as right. a nation, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Like even Peter Tatchell, did you see this thing on, at the weekend? There was, a, there was an anti, anti, um, anti-China, pro-democracy protester in Hong Kong, but her sign of being pro-democracy and anti-China was to, to wave a Union Jack, and, and she was arrested by the police, and it's a real um, menacing sign of the, 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 the crackdown of um, the Chinese Communist Party uh, on those who are pro-democracy in, in Hong Kong. But Peter Tatchell kind of tweeted out, you know, she's a brave woman, but I'm you know, a bit disappointed by her waving the Union Jack. Mm. As though this like woman risking her life, you know, like in the in the cause of righteousness. <laughs> like, yeah, a bit jingoistic and bit, you know, a, a little bit uh, yeah. a little bit pro U, pro UK. And you are just like, well, let let her choose her sign. Um, she seems to have earned it. But but there's that that sense that, oh, to be embroiled in the Union Jack is to be embroiled in colonialism mm. and 
all that comes with it. Um, which, but, but again, that's, that's coming from a place of we're taught not to be proud of our heritage. You know, Peter sure. Tatchell, like myself, from Australia, spent most of his life in the, in the UK. But we're, we're taught not to um, be proud of our heritage and taught not to, you know, like when you, when you ask, you know, how are you doing? You know, not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and so we, yeah, yeah, I think back to like the Olympics in 2012. Yes. Like the, the mood before it was... Well, it's going to be a disaster, isn't it? <laughs> we'll stuff it up, you yeah, know. Yeah. Like, and then the opening ceremony happened and everyone was going, oh, my goodness. Oh, like, good. We've done a good job, actually. Yeah. Like, who saw that coming? <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Is it, yeah, they got Danny Boyle to do the, the opening ceremony. Yeah, yeah. They? Like, yeah. And did it take a Scott to kind of be, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's, he probably should have been more dour than anyone else. But it's a um, threat coming from the north again, isn't yeah. it? Like, <laughs> But so here's the big question, like where, where is our sense of hope coming from and what is it that we're looking to? And what we're going to do is um, compare sort of secular sources about where um, signs of hope might come from with biblical sources about where signs of hope might come from. And what we're going to do is turn to a, a very hopeful um, Canadian called Stephen Pinker. Uh, who's written many books like *The Better Angel*, uh, *Better Nature of Our Angel*, *Better Angels of Our Nature*, and uh, *Enlightenment Now*. And uh, Stephen Pinker is very much a humanist um, in the Enlightenment tradition, and he he would say that the world is getting better, and that's because we've been getting less religious. And hooray for reason and science and Enlightenment values. Mm. And so um, let's have a look at um, some of the statistics that he points to, which are really interesting, and 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 I think worth taking very seriously about how the world is getting better. And then we'll talk about um, why we think the world might be getting better and in what ways that might be true and might not be true. But let, let's have a look at Stephen Pinker. The world has made tremendous progress against extreme poverty, the minimum amount of income necessary to feed your family. Now about less than 10% of the world falls in extreme poverty. Just three decades ago, it was 30%. That the progress that we've enjoyed did not happen all by itself. The ingredients for continued progress are present. Thinking about the well-being of men, women, and children, that's the overall philosophy I call humanism. Progress comes from, from people solving problems, from uh, people setting the goal of improving the lot of humanity, and it comes from just the overall application of reason. It's only by looking at trends that you realize how much progress that we've made. To be a happier person, you can't let your view of the world be determined by news headlines. Because as long as bad events haven't vanished from the face of the earth, there'll always be enough of them to fill the news. Wars still go on, including the worst war in a generation in, in, in uh, Syria. But by and large, the trend in war has been uh, downward. A fraction of the number of people are killed in wars today compared to the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. The signing of the Colombian Peace Agreement, the last war in the Western Hemisphere came to an end, so an entire hemisphere is free of war. In fact, five-sixths of the Earth's surface is free of war. That's an example of a kind of trend that you can't really pick up from the news because when a country doesn't have a war, it's not news. Child mortality is down, maternal mortality is down, uh, liter illiteracy is down, 90% uh, of the world's population under the age of 25 can read and write. We're even getting smarter in a, a phenomenon called the Flynn Effect. IQ scores have been rising by three points a decade for uh, almost a century. We spend waste less of our waking hours on uh, housework. We work fewer hours. We have access to uh, culture. All these developments that just never make the news, but that give you a, a, a bit more confidence in the way the world is heading. Move backward, if we look nostalgically to a golden age, which ne never existed, uh, if we prioritize competition between nations over overall cooperation, if we fall prey to dogma and charisma and superstition as opposed to hard-headed reason, then, then progress could slow down and, and in some cases even reverse. And despite the, some of the uh, unfortunate political events of the last couple of years, there's a, an enormous will to uh, Im improve the state of humanity, to, to lift up uh, formerly oppressed minorities, to advance the, the rights of women, to advance the uh, well-being of people in the developing world. And if we can continue to mobilize that uh, energy, then 
future progress is absolutely possible. There we go. That's uh, Stephen Pinker talking about the world getting better. Um, so yeah, already in the chat, people are asking, I, don't, I do not know what world Pinker lives in. Seriously deluded. And Christopher said, it all depends on where you look and what you count as getting better. So, yeah. Is the world getting better or isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, um, it's like, like we said, I suppose it just depends on the metric you use. Yeah. I mean, if... There, there are obviously things he points to there where you could say, you know, so it is the case that poverty has dropped. Um, but, you know, yeah, it, but then you'd look around our, our country as well and you'd say in the last 10 years or so, things like the use of the food, food, food banks have yep. shot up and stuff. Right. So, I mean, right. how do you measure, right. you know, that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Christopher said, for instance, life expectancy has actually stagnated and then dropped slightly in the US since 2013. Um, but would you prefer to live in 2013 or 1913? Or 1813? Or 1313? Sure. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point, isn't it? Over the longer term, I think it's really hard to, to doubt that. Um, there, I mean, certainly on a moral plane, we're not morally better than we were in, in the year 1013. Sure. Um, but technologically, and, and even the rate of change that has happened, you know, I, on Twitter um, just last week, there, was, there were the pictures of um, the very first plane flight and man walking on the moon. And obviously, you know, very, very grainy black and white for the very first plane flight. And then this amazing, stunning color picture of people walking on the face of the moon. And those two photographs were taken 60 years from one another. Yeah. Like, what? That's absolutely stunning in terms of the rate of, like, to be able to, you know, like, no flight, no flight, no flight, no flight, no flight, no flight. <laughs> suddenly we're flying. Suddenly we're flying to the moon. Um, I mean, we haven't been back, but... <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think, I think that... I think you could probably say broadly, couldn't you, therefore, that... Yeah, I mean, stuff has moved on so far. Hmm. But, yeah, you could say there's definitely been overall improvement... Yeah. In in life. Yes. You know, you, you Yeah. I I think that would be hard to debate. Yeah. And people I mean and people brought out of absolute poverty is just is just stunning. Um Christophe has again talked about um in Paris you could rent a room per month in a hotel near the Eiffel Tower in Paris <laughs> as recently <laughs> as the nineteen seventies for a fraction of minimum wage. Um and so, so we're, we're just laughing there because everybody's <laughs> trying to put that comment on the screen at the same time and we keep putting it up and down. So, so. Toggling off, toggling on. Just none of us trusting the other than me. It's mainly <laughs> my problem. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the idea that... Um, yeah, the, the, the idea that you could live in the centre of Paris um, on minimum wage is unthinkable today, just as it would be in London. Mm. Um, and so certainly inequality... Is is massively increased, yeah. Um, but those who are no longer in absolute poverty um, has, has gone through the floor, right? Um, so you know we've got we've got some other um, uh, graphs to show you. Um, where are they? Uh, okay, you do you do them, Thomas. <laughs> I trust you. I trust you. So, for instance, could you uh, show us the extreme poverty graph? Um, so the percentage of the world population living in extreme po poverty from 1820 to uh, 2015. And so, you know, you go from 1820 and 92, 93% in wow. extreme poverty and you come to 2015 and we're talking about 10%, you know. Um, now, is there, is there much greater inequality um, in income? Yes, there are. And, and like the, the amounts... Of, of personal wealth that Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates have compared to the poorest person on planet Earth is just ri absolutely ridiculous. But would you rather, if, if you are right at the bottom... I like this game. Here we go. You've got a button in front of you. And if you press the button, you can lift everybody out of extreme poverty, but it means that the top 1% will be even, even more fabulously wealthy and that they'll be 100 times more wealthy than they are. But you've lifted everybody out of extreme poverty. Do you, uh -huh. do you press that button? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, you, <laughs> <laughs> like, you, I was thinking, is this a trick question? Well, like, <laughs> like, no, no, I know what you when mean. Because some, like that, you, you'd have to be a monster not to. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And but, you're not a monster. Let's, let's, let's well, well, I mean, you have your moments. What but, metrics are we using? Yeah. Like, <laughs> No, some people would just. I, I, it, obviously, there is inequality. Yeah. But like you say, if if we if it, if it could lift everyone out, mm. in a sense, it, if even if those guys have got loads and loads of more money than anyone else. Yeah. Um, you know, I I don't really take a huge issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so is it more difficult for people these days to get onto the property ladder and all all sorts of things? Um, I think yes, mm. and. Um, might things have been better 50 years ago, possibly, for some people? Yes. But are things better economically? I'm just talking economically. Are things better economically um, today than they were 200 years ago? Would you, would you rather economically live in 2021 or 1821? And, and I think unless you were fabulously wealthy aristocracy, you're probably not going to say 1821. Right. So I think, I think economically, um, we, we, we are doing better. And I think technologically, um, we are undoubtedly doing better. That is absolutely not the same to say that morally we are you know, better people. And one of the things that Stephen Pinker is trying to do in that video is kind of link sort of the progress that we've made on, on various issues like civil rights and that sort of thing. And civil rights has been a, you know, a wonderful you know, step forward in, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, but I think it is an unearned sense that we are morally superior to those in 1821. Okay, yeah. Um, I think that, that, that is to be determined. Hmm. Um, but I think there are all sorts of metrics by which you can say um, the world has become a more, more prosperous place for a greater number of the, the people. Hmm. Um, and, and yet, as Stephen Pinker says, it's, um, it's difficult to get that message across because if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. And because, you know, our, um, we, are, we are primed for threats rather than opportunities, you know, because if a threat takes you out, you're gone for good. If you miss an opportunity, okay, maybe an opp another opportunity so you might come along. will come along. But if you, if you don't deal properly with a threat, that's you, that's you gone. And so our, our minds and, you know, our brains are wired to spot threats mm. more than they are opportunities, I think. And so... Are we saying, therefore, that in this kind of social media age, mm. not only do we notice, not only do we notice the threats more, mm. that they are being put on display more as well? Yeah. So not only is it the news media, it's not only the media itself is putting out those kind of stories in a way to catch your attention, but just general everyday. I mean, even your friends on Facebook are probably just will put stuff yeah. that catches your attention, right? Which you wouldn't have known about before. Right. You know, 15 years ago, I right. wouldn't have known about right. certain situations. Right. And media outlets are wanting to hack into your, um, your sense of outrage or your sense of fear. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're angry or, or if you're afraid, you'll click. So what are they going to feed you? Stuff that makes you outraged and makes you afraid. Yeah. You know, and so they'll increasingly, you know, feed you that diet and we'll incre increasingly doom scroll. Unless, unless we find... Um, a kind of a, a different source. And, and I think um, the scriptures, obviously, are, um, give, give us a, a very different feel, even though quite often it's, it's I think, Christians quite rightly um, push back against Stephen Pinker's thesis on certain moral grounds. So, for instance, there, there's a um, graph, Thomas, if you could bring up um, the one about homicides. Um, yeah, he says that Europe is, is less violent. There's a, there's a decline of homicide in Western Europe, and you can kind of see annual homicides per 100,000 people, and it's gone down to sort of less, less than 10 over, over the course of, you know, let's say 700 years. Um, but one of the issues is as soon as you factor in the unborn, well, we already kill about 750 um, babies per hundred thousand just in the womb mm. so our, our homicide levels in the womb are already like far in advance of the bad old days of the dark ages yeah wow. um and yet that you know they don't count we don't Stephen count Pinker's, that in the metric uh, analysis and so uh, are we a less violent civilization well we hide it better mm. you know 
it's it's doctors with scalpels, you know, doing it in the dark, rather than armies, you know, overrunning other armies. Are we less violent? No. Um, we've just found different ways of being violent. Um, so, so that th that's one like very proper pushback against Steven Pinker, and I think the whole issue of of we haven't morally improved just because we've all got iPhones now. Like that doesn't make us <laughs> that doesn't make us better people. Um, but I think I think there's another impetus within Christians that might not be helpful. That that I think we can we can be so invested in it's all going to hell in a handbasket right. so much that I think we resist some of the stats that are undeniable that Stephen Pinker brings to us. Mm. Um, and and I think part of that is we have inherited a kind of a doom-mongering attitude such that you know, even when we talk about something being apocalyptic, we tend to think, oh, that's a bad thing. And we think, oh, the end of the world, that's a bad thing. Yeah. Whereas biblically... Pretty good. It's quite good. Yeah. It's quite good. Do you think that's a particularly Western thing? Go on. No, I mean... I'm. Well, that was the question. No, <laughs> no but the idea that we've bought into that, like, like if you went to kind of, um, I don't know, Southern Hemisphere, mm. um, Latin America, mm. um, Asian Christians, right. or, or wherever, yeah. do you think they would have the same attitude toward, you know, like it's all going to hell in a handbasket? I don't, I don't, I legitimately yeah. don't know whether that's there or whether it's a particularly Western I think thing. they, I think um, people who... Um, are suffering injustice and poverty, cry out, how long, O oh Lord, in a way that we in the West don't. Mm. You know, because they're, 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 they're longing for the judge to come and show them justice. Mm. Whereas we're like, oh, not so sure I want the judge, I'm not so sure I want justice. We, we kind of rely on the rule of law and a police force that can by and large be trusted mm. in places where they can't. They cry out for the judge, which feels like really weird in, yeah. in the prosperous West. We're like... You don't want the judge. You don't. You know. You don't want law enforcement. You don't want actual justice to 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 be brought to bear. Whereas in the Bible, people are always they want Crying justice. justice. Yeah. Oh Lord, how long we want justice? And and so yeah, I, I would say people cry out Maranatha, come, O Lord, um, a lot more mm. uh, than than we tend to in the comfortable West. Mm. I would say, but it, it's just the sense of of um, here. In the West, being comfortable, um, I think Christians, I think Christians can be more doom mongering <laughs> than the New Testament would warrant. I mean, let's 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 have a look at, for instance. I mean, do we have? Um, we probably don't have uh, um, Romans fifteen, do we, on a slide? But Romans Romans fifteen, I, I love this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's this, there's this ebullient, overflowing, life-giving nature to God who wants to fill you with joy and peace. And then from the overflow of the joy and peace that you receive from God, you overflow by the power of the Holy Spirit with this one thing that's going to mark you out from everyone else around, mm. and that is hope. Um, which, which is to assume that actually the, the, the atmosphere of the Christian is hope-filled, yeah. whereas the atmosphere of the world is more cynical. Mm -hmm. And I, I, just want, I, I certainly have imbibed far more of the spirit of cynicism than am overflowing with the, with the, power, with, with, with the, with the joy of hope you know, in, in, in that sense. And, and so I'm, I'm very challenged by this. Um, because I, I think, you know, 1 Peter 3.15 is like the verse on personal evangelism. And it's, and it's like, always be prepared to give an answer to all the people who are coming up and asking you, how are you such a hopeful person? Yeah. <laughs> like, that is, that is like, if you're looking for tips and techniques in evangelism, um, well, be a hope-filled person. Mm. Be someone who prompts the question, how on earth are you still standing after the year that you've just had? What keeps you going? Because you seem like you've got hope. Um, do we do we ooze hope in that? Do we overflow with hope in that sense? And I got to say, you know, not so much. No, no. And I wonder whether. I mean, I think I'm susceptible to the doom scrolling mm -hmm. thing. You know, mm -hmm. this kind of just just going through and just feeling like 
everything just feels like it's terrible, mm. you know. Um, and I wonder, but I do, I do sometimes think to myself that it, I wonder what the experience is. I mean, that's for me as a Christian. I wonder what it's like for people who aren't Christians when they're going for that, because at least I have a, a, an ability to have some perspective on that and to step back from it and to look and say, well, there, there might be a lot of terrible things going on, yeah. but I do at least have a hope that this will be put right at some point. You know, nothing that is going on in the news today, there will no, there will no, no injustice will be left. Hmm. You know, kind of without being, you know, without justice being done, there'll be nothing that isn't, you know, eventually um, sorted um, or uh, done away with. Hmm. Whereas if you're a, if you're a non-Christian, if you have, or or for whatever reason, you know, you have no ultimate hope in in that. Hmm. It must, be, it must be a bit overwhelming at times. Yeah. Yeah. When the pandemic bears down, you've got, you've got no promise that you're getting through this thing. You know, how, why, you know, why, sh- un- unless it's just, I'm an optimistic person. I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of a person. And so I'm going to believe that somehow we'll get through, you know, the, the pandemic. If you don't, if you don't have promises that you're grounding your life on, then yeah just kind of wishful thinking at that point yes. isn't it like yes it's a bit it's a bit like we've talked about it so many times Stephen fry being asked about his depression and mm. how do you get through it oh, i just remember this one sun will come out tomorrow and like well you've got nothing to base that on in your atheism yeah you know that's just wishful thinking the sun yeah. might not come out tomorrow in the sense that you know you might decide tonight that you can't take anymore right and right you know and that's that, and that's you done yeah you know yeah there's and there's no guarantee that this cloud will ever lift yeah. in your life yeah. for all kinds of different reasons but yeah. he's just telling himself oh it'll get better i right. mean that's and we're the irrational ones <laughs> right <No. laughs> yeah and and he even said in that in that interview where he, he talked about the sun will come out tomorrow he said there is nothing na- rational about this but you've got to think in these terms mm. which is just fascinating because he sees it as a tug of war between being rational or helping you with your mental health and you're like well why not have both yeah. you know <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if you could think harder about stuff that actually makes you into a more positive person? Mm-hmm. And what is it that we're meant to sort of think harder about? And, and I think it's, it's, for instance, the, the resurrection. Um, so let's have up on the screen uh, 1 Corinthians 15, because here, here is where we're really meant to ground our hope. Uh, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. The end, that sounds horrible. Except, you know, in the in the New Testament, the word end is telos. And, and it has that is double meaning of, yeah, is it goal or is it, you know, the finish? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of both. Like the goal is when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Next slide. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Psalm 110. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. And, like, from these verses, what you get the sense of is Christ has plumbed our depths and risen to God's heights, and he is the first fruits that guarantees a bumper crop of resurrection. So mm-hmm. if we're connected to him, we have the deposit of the Holy Spirit, and we will be raised just as he is raised. The chapter then goes on to say that the whole world will be raised on the pattern of Christ's resurrection. So we'll be connected to Christ. The physical world will be connected to Christ, pulled down into death, and then up into resurrection. And what is happening in history right now is that all dominion and authority is being brought under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel has been going out to the nations and the the nations are being discipled. And the very last enemy that will be defeated by Christ is death itself. Mm. And then the end comes when God is all in all. It's the most most hope-filled, optimistic view of the world. And we're kind of in the middle of that story. Yeah, we are between when the first fruits appeared, and when the bumper crop will, you know, be raised up. But we're in the process of seeing 
I would say, I, I would say we're in the process of seeing how dominion and authority has been brought under the feet of the Lord Jesus. And the culmination of that process will be the final resurrection of the dead. And this is what makes me a very hope-filled Christian when it comes to eschatology and the doctrine of the last things. Um, so I guess you would call me a very optimistic amillennial or, you know, sometimes, you know, at Christmas I become post-mill because uh, <laughs> all, the, all the Christmas readings are, are all like, you know, and the, and the government will be upon Christ's shoulders and um, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Um, but whether, you know, whether, whether you're amill or post-mill, um, there is obviously pre-mill as well. That's a different eschatological position, but... Um, to me, it seems like this, there is all the scope in the world for a heck of a lot of um, positivity and optimism. Um, so we've had uh, a couple of people bring up some other scriptures. Uh, Giles Woodcraft says, but our hope is not based on how this world is going. Absolutely right. Um, we should be cynical about the world. 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5. Yeah, in these last days, there will come people. Um, and it describes the kind of people who in the first century were incredibly cynical and backbiting and, and, and perverse, and they sound very similar to the people that there are around today. So these last days have been going on for a very long time. So if, if, if 2 Timothy 3 is describing the last days, then for 2,000 years we've been going through the last days. Mm. Um, so I, so do, does, that, does that mean that in the 21st century will be much worse than we were in the 19th century, much worse than we were in the 13th century. I, I don't think 2 Timothy 3 commits you to that um, and, and to things getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, because I, I think at the same time as lots of things being incredibly difficult in this world, there are also the signs of spring, the signs of summer. Um, and so the... Um, really, really the overwhelming analogy for, for what this age feels like is childbirth. Throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, it's where we are going through the sufferings of childbirth. Um, and new life is going to come. And you ask the, the mother after she's just given birth, was it very painful? <laughs> she's <laughs> like, yeah, slightly. <laughs> um, was it worth it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but does, does there... Does any of this necessitate that, that the moral depravity of the world is worse in 21st century Britain than it was in 3rd century Mongolia, right? Hmm. I don't, like, I'm, I'm, struggling to, I'm, I'm struggling to think why we would think that 21st century, 21st century Britain has a lot of godlessness to it. Um, but... Uh, does our eschatology commit us to saying it's worse than, I don't know, Aztec priests ripping out the hearts of virgins to ensure that the sun will rise the next day or, or whatever, you know? Mm. And maybe it is as bad, but like, I don't, th I don't think we're committed to, to, to that kind of eschatology. No. Um, Russell Eichen has asked, what do you think we should teach ourselves from the second part of Luke 18 verse 8? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Um, well, obviously, the Son of Man coming in the Gospels um, has a number of different horizons to it. So when Jesus teaches about um, uh, when Jesus teaches about the end, sometimes he's talking about the end of Jerusalem. And actually, Luke 19 makes that very, very clear that um, one way of considering the end is when the temple, which is this like microcosm, this picture of heaven and earth, gets absolutely trashed and destroyed by the Romans, and not a stone is left one on the other, and that is a a portent of of like the world being brought through death, but it's it's, it's the world being brought through death and out the other side, and actually our title for um, today, summer is coming, is taken from that Luke nineteen passage. Um, the parallel is in. Mark 13, Jesus talks about the, the destruction of the temple. Um, but he says, you know, you know the signs of the times, you know, when the fig tree is in bud, you know that summer is coming. 
And these are just some of the ways that Jesus talks about, you know, the end. So, so in that famous passage, Luke 19 or, or Mark 13, he talks about the end, meaning like the goal of all things. He, he talks about birth. You know, the, these things are a sign of, the, these things are birth pains. Mm. You know, when, when there's war, these things, he doesn't say they are death throes. He says they are birth pains. Um, and he talks about summer, you know, when the fig tree is in blossom, you know that summer is coming. He talks about the cloud of his presence. He talks about gathering. He talks about the power and glory of the Son of Man coming. In amongst a whole bunch of wars and rumors of wars and like terrible suffering. Um, but it doesn't mean that every century has to get worse than the last century, I don't think. No, no, I don't think so. But sometimes, sometimes es- people's eschatology makes them expect that every century will get worse than than the next, and then and and I think that same eschatology can make people think they're not they're not living the Christian life right unless they're really getting persecuted, hmm. unless they're really getting dragged in front of the the authorities for their witness to Christ. Like they're not they're not being a proper Christian. Sure. Yeah. And I don't know. That's that's not really my reading. Um, no. Yeah, Terry Eves says, Hebrews 1 says, uh, Hebrews 1 makes it clear that the last days began with the appearance of Jesus and all that his life and ministry has accomplished. So, so it does seem to me, I'm quite optimistic. I I think of the increase of Christ's government, there will be no end. Um, I think Jesus himself said it, you know, like, like yeast working through a batch of dough, so his kingdom will grow, or like a mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but it grows to become the largest of all plants, so that even the birds of the air will perch in its branches, which is fascinating in, in Matthew, Matthew 13, 13, because, because the last time you saw the birds, was, they were gobbling up the seeds, just like Satan. Mm-hmm. But suddenly the birds, at the end of things, the birds will be perching within the structure that Christianity built. Um, that's somehow... There will be a or, or, or think of Daniel. Daniel talks in chapter 2 about the small stone that's going to hit the mountain and, and that's going to hit the statue that you know, refers to all the world's empires. And it grows into a mountain that has dominion over all the earth. And the, the scriptures, I would say, the scriptures, I would say, are very optimistic. Um, yeah, Giles Woodcraft has, has uh, mentioned, what about the great distress unequaled from the beginning? In Matthew 24 and in Daniel 11. Yeah, there is, there is great distress at times. And um, obviously there is the first fulfillment of Matthew 24, which is the, the Mark 13, Luke 19 um, passage. Aren't your audio is gone. Is my audio gone? Audio's back. And back. back. Okay. Um, yeah, that, the great distress in Matthew 23. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Um, the great distress in Matthew 24 um, is parallel to Mark 13 and Luke 19. Um, so Luke 19 makes it very clear that the Roman armies surrounding Jerusalem um, is the first fulfillment of Matthew 13, which is Mark, thir- you know, uh, Matthew 24, which is Mark 13. And so, um, yeah, the, there is huge distress when the temple is sacked and AD 70 happens. Um, and I think in between now and the end times, um, and the end of all things, um, there will be times that are just like that. Um, but I don't think we are to expect that every century is worse than the last. And I, and I don't think that we can deny or have to deny the huge progress that we see in things like Stephen Pinker's graphs. Mm. One of the big problems I see with Stephen Pinker's position is is that he he kind of credits humanism with the mass you know the massive progress, and so he says uh, ever since we had Christianity in the rearview mirror, things have been getting better and better and better. And better. Um, now, obviously, that's a very different thesis to somebody like Tom Holland's thesis, um, who would just say, "Look, we are still." within this massive revolution called the Jesus Revolution. Um, and the very, the very idea that we value human beings is totally down to Christianity yeah. and not down to anything that reason can tell you or science can tell you. Because science will not look in the womb and tell you that you should accord the unborn any, any, value. any value or rights. 
that's the, those are values we bring to the table, and we bring them to the table wonderfully um, because culturally we followed Christ, who descended to the depths, you know, and, and showed us where God can be found, and He can be found in the weak and the marginalized. Mm. So, lots of stuff in there. Um, when when you when you do a study of hope in the Bible, Paul, um, what what do people tend to hope in as as we study the scriptures on this? Yeah, so the, I mean, the two big ones that seem to crop up um, in the New Testament is hope in the resurrection, um, but also hope in the fulfillment of the promises to the patriarchs, really. That's the, the kind of things where the hope lies, is the area, really. Yes. Yeah. And false hopes are obviously... Right, yeah. And so the, so the, the flip side is people putting their hope in... Um, so money was one of them. So that was that was uh, interesting with Paul and Silas, um, and the people making money from the the girl who uh, she have a demon. Was that the mm-hmm. story? Um, and they Act see Act seventeen, Act sixteen. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then they see that there is no hope. Uh, their hope of making money is taken away. I just thought it was a really interesting use of the word hope in there, that the hope is in making money. Yes. Um, but then also the New Testament, you know, speaks about, you know, before you were, you know, in Ephesians 2, you know, once you were separated and you had no hope. Yeah. Um, or it talks about kind of grieving, grieving for those who've died. Um, we, we don't want you to have, be without hope mm. uh, like everyone else. Mm. So there's a sense in which... Um, the New Testament sees those outsiders putting their hope in certain things, but ultimately having no hope yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I've always loved this um, cartoon by, by Matt in The Telegraph. Um, for those who can't see it, it's, it's a man with a kind of a massive placard, and you would expect him to be carrying some kind of, you know, the end is nigh kind of a placard. Instead, in capital letters on his placard, it just says, everything may be okay. And there's a couple walking past him, and the man turns to his wife and just says, "Lunatic." Um, and I, I, I love that because it's, it shows the way in which we might be countercultural. Um, and I think there's there's all the call in the world for pointing to the world and saying, "Look, if you are relying on making money, let's say, or if you are relying on simply family love, or you're relying on simply your health." to get you through, those are vain hopes for deliverance. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, there is a broader hope to, to trust in. Um, and if we model that broader hope to trust in, if we, if we, we model hope in the resurrection, um, then we can be this very countercultural body on earth when, you know, three or four or five percent of, you know, Brits or Australians, like, say, you know they they're hopeful in in that kind of sense to be to be those who you know actually have a much deeper more profound more more shaping hope i th- i think could be a massive witness and obviously 1 peter 3 says that's at the starting point for an should evangelistic be the thing isn't it that people see yeah the yeah. hope should be the difference yeah i think so but yeah i mean Obviously, we're not we're not saying hope that GDP rises, you know, in the next ten years, <laughs> or hope that more people get brought out of um, poverty, or hope that infant mortality continues to to um, go down. It's it's a far more profound hope than that. But but I I do think an orientation towards the Christ who is our first fruits, who went down into death but rose up again to life. I think that ought to make us people who who then when we're asked. You know, how are you doing? Or, you know, what are you looking forward to? I think mm. we should have a distinctive answer to that, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and I, I think it's a challenge to me to think, you know, what if someone said to you, what is, your, what is my hope? Mm. You know, what the answer would be to that. And I, often, and I think I wonder as well, like, I think, I think it was Christoph Keating said in one of the comments that people often, I wonder if people just never think about these things. Mm. I, It'd be interesting to ask people we know who are not Christians, like, what is your hope in? Yeah. You know, because I don't think people necessarily think with that category. You know, they don't think, like, my hope is in, yeah. you know, 
a, a nice warm retirement or whatever it is, you know, with plenty of cash to keep going. Maybe, you know, maybe they do, but they might not think of it in quite that those terms. But if you put it to people, what is their hope in? It'd be interesting to see what came up. Um, and I, I mean, I've said this a number of times before. I think people often don't think about these things because when you really start to think about them, you start to realize how yeah. hopeless, <laughs> right? you know, the things you put your hope in probably are. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, particularly in the face of, of death, um, you know the even even again. I think it was Christoph Keating had said on on in the comments about Pinker's thing. It all becomes pointless anyway when you realise, mm. you know, that in the origin there was no purpose. At the end, there's no purpose. It all ends in heat death and yep. whatnot. I mean, if you stop and really think about that, you think, well, why why are we doing anything? Yeah. You know, if you've got nothing else than that, yeah. If that is the scope of your world and your universe, yeah. You know, one thing isn't it to say, oh, well, I pass my genes on to the next generation to keep them going. <laughs> you know, my children can have a good life. And they go, yeah. And then, yeah. And then they'll die. Yeah. And their children will die and they will die. And then, you know, but yeah. society keeps going, you know, progressing. And you're like, yeah. Does it? <laughs> until, yeah, yeah possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Until everything dies. Yeah. You know, all the great wonders yeah. of the world, all the great works of art, literature, gone. None of it will ever have mattered. Yeah. You know, if that is your outlook. Yeah. I yeah. mean, flipping egg. This yeah. sounds a bit hopeless. <laughs> yeah, it totally is. And, you know, I mean, Woody Allen, who's just famously afraid of death, was once asked, you know, doesn't it, but doesn't it, you know, warm the cockles of your heart to know that you will live on in the memories of people whose lives you've touched through your art? And Woody Allen said, I don't want to live on in, uh, in, in people's hearts. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know. And, it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't actually provide solace or, no. or hope, you know. And when you think about the Apostle Paul in the ancient world, in Acts 17, he goes to Athens and there are some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And what's interesting about them is that they're very clever people. They're Athenian philosophers. They're going to set the, the trajectory for all of Western thought, you know henceforth but but both of them are just trying to manage their mortality so the epicure they're, they're, they're both saying we're gonna die mm -hmm. and the epicureans are saying okay well then just try and have as much fun as you can as much pleasure as you can anyway and and stoics are like well just be as virtuous as you can you know and but none of none of them all of them are accepting this system of death mm -hmm. and just trying to make do as best they can under the system of death. And then Paul comes, and what are the two things he's constantly rabbiting on about? He says, Jesus and the resurrection. And he's constantly babbling about Jesus. What is this babbler saying? You know, he's, he's advocating these strange gods. And it was, Paul was talking about anastasis, the word, the Greek yeah, word for resurrection. resurrection. He was talking about anastasis so much, they thought that she was a god, mm. you know, Anastasia. He keeps on going on about this Anastasia quite a lot. That's how much, like, resurrection. And if, I think if that was necessary in the first century, I think it's, it's very much necessary in the, in the 21st century to, to be rabbiting on about Anastasis, you know, resurrection, and to be a person of hope. Well, that's very, I think that's very true as well. So, I mean, like, because particularly we've talked about how in the last 18 months or so during the pandemic, people have been more confronted with immortality. And you talked mm. to John Baer and he said, we don't really see death. Mm. I mean, but I mean, it was kind of brought home to me like the last few weeks when someone in our town passed away who was kind of only, you know, in her 40s, you know, just dropped dead brain aneurysm just in the back garden, just, you know, gone, mm. you know, um, and no warning or anything like that. Mm. And um, what I was really struck by on Facebook was like lots of people were commenting on you know, the post that kind of her husband had put up, you know, and stuff. Hundreds of comments, you know, lovely comments, you know, um, and all, you know, all kind of very positive about, about her. But I said what struck me was there was just like, they were really empty. Hmm. Like there was nothing in there apart from like, oh, this is sad. Hmm. There's no hope really. I mean, there, there was that kind of, there were of course ones that were saying like, I know one day I'll see you again, you know, say hi to... I know you're with your mum or what, all those things now, but not in it, not, not with any grounding in anything, just, mm. and then other people saying things like, I know I'll never see you again and mm. stuff. Hmm. And he was talking about it with the, with the, the vicar. Um, and yeah, so it just struck me just people had no mm. hope in the face of death. Yeah. Like people had nothing of any, there was nothing really anyone could say apart from just pleasantries. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas actually as Christians, we have something to say in the face of death. Yeah. Because we know the one who's been into death and come back through it. Yeah. 
and therefore there's a hope for us, you know, and a hope for for everyone. Um, yeah, funerals are the are the real compare and contrast. I yeah. think you, you go to a funeral of a saint who loved Jesus and you know went out of this world face beaming, ready to to meet Jesus face to face, and the the singing in that service and the testimonies and the and the you know it's definitely sad and we mm, yeah, we, we grieve as 2 Thessalonians 3 says but you know not as those without hope mm. and the the hope that is like really right at the heart of like a christian funeral full of singing you know it's it's like that episode of uh, the crown have you seen the one where the um I watched it abba fan oh it's it's brilliant if you abba fan abba fan so <laughs> oh abba <laughs> Right, I'm with you now. It is, it is a tragedy. A massive ABBA yeah. fan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was it Mamma Mia? Uh, <laughs> Actually, Paul, it was a terrible yes, tragedy. Yes, I'm familiar. Yes, I am familiar with yes, ABBA fan. Having yeah, grown yeah, up yeah, in yeah. Wales. You need to enunciate. That's yes. what it is. <laughs> ABBA fan. ABBA fan. So, yeah, landslide took out of primary school and, I don't know, it was like a, more than 100 dead. Yeah, teachers um, and children, wasn't it? Yeah, children. slid down the hill, didn't it, there, from the mining. And... And Prince Philip went to the funeral and was just so struck by the singing. You know, mm. there, there was there was a fierceness um, in the face of death. To to there was, there was an anger in the face of death that that Jesus rightly gives to us. You know, just as he was angry at the at the graveside of of um, Lazarus, so you know we can you know, this final enemy, death. We we hate death. Um, but we sing battle cries uh, against it. And that's where 1 Corinthians 15 ends up. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, mm. is your sting? Um, and, and he was really struck by the singing at the funeral. It's a very Christian thing to do, to sing <laughs> defiantly mm. um, at death and over death and, and to express confidence in a hope that is greater than death and that... Not that Auntie Edna is going on to the afterlife, because there's no such thing in the Bible. You know, we are pre-life. You know, we are seeds. One day we'll be trees. We are acorns. One day we'll be oaks. You know, yeah. we're pre-life now. And one day we'll be, you know, risen again and we sing that. The difference between that and like a humanist funeral is just night and day. Yeah. And so no wonder, like Ecclesiastes 7 says, if you want to learn wisdom, go to the funeral. Don't go to the party. Go to the funeral. Um, and as we face our mortality then maybe we'll we'll kind of learn wisdom and as we can be people of hope in the midst of you know even life's great finality um then i think that will be our witness to to the world mm. um that should do us for now i'm um, sorry we're still uh, figuring out some of the audio problems but we're getting there people we're getting there we've yeah. got um i think it's been much better from what people have said so yeah that's positive. We will continue to work on that. And uh, if you guys want to catch up with this on the podcast, then find the Speak Life podcast on uh, your podcatcher of choice. What are some other ways that people can keep up with us? Yeah, you can follow us on all the social medias. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, uh, all those ones. Uh, and YouTube, of course, where you are now. Uh, so give us a like or follow there. And then, of course, if you want to keep up with bits and bobs, you can get our email that goes out each week. Go to speaklife.org.uk forward slash sign up and you can sign up there. Fantastic. And uh, do uh, hit like and subscribe here on the YouTube channel. On Friday, we will have uh, our new series called Waka Waka, which, is, which stands for What We Wish Others Knew About What Our Christianity Is About. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, and we're starting. Yeah, we're starting this series, sort of answering common objections to Christianity and uh, giving an introduction to uh, the things of Jesus in a hopefully amusing way. But we we try it anyway. Terry Eves says, "Thanks, fellas. So appreciate these conversations. Thank you, Terry, and uh, mm. thank you for tuning Good in. Good to have people on board commenting. Always thank nice. You to Christoph and Giles and Amanda and Wendy and lots of other people in the top chat. Please keep the comments going down below. But that should do us for now. Um, thank Thank you, everybody, and uh, we will see you again next week. Take care. Bye-bye.